Jaina Proudmoore was born before the First War and is the youngest child of Admiral Dalin Proudmoore. Hello everyone. The story of Jaina Proudmoore. That is one of the first lore videos that I've ever done, dating back all the way to June 2012. Six years have passed, and quite a lot of you asked if I could make an updated version, since in those six years, quite a lot has happened to Jaina. Her story, it, it still begins the same. She's the youngest child of Admiral Dalen Proudmoore, ruler of Kal Tirith. Her mother is Catherine Proudmoore, and her two brothers are named Derek and Tandrit. The second brother was once upon a time set to not be canon, not part of the official lore, but they've since changed their mind. Now Dalen and Kal Tirith, they joined the Alliance of Lordaeron as they fought the war against the Horde, offering their mighty fleet and skills on the high seas to repel the invaders. The Alliance was able to force the Horde to retreat as they were sieged in Lordaeron, yet the Horde had also recruited some mighty forces into the ranks, some willingly, while others were forced. Alex Straza and her Red Dragon Flight, they were part of those that were forced to cooperate. Near the island of Crestfall, the Alliance Navy overtook the Horde fleet, trying to make their way back to Stormwind. Dalin skillfully outmaneuvered his foes and hammered them with cannon fire. The dragons swooped down from the skies and engulfed the Alliance ships in sheets of fire. The Wild Hammer Dwarves, also allied with the Alliance of Lordaeron, with their lightning and fused storm hammers, they fought back against the friend in the skies, while the cannon fire painted the waves red. The Alliance won this decisive victory at sea and destroyed most of the Horde's navy, but the cost had been great. The Red Dragons had decimated Proudmoore's own ships. Many brave sailors had died, including his son Derek. Dalin would never forget his child's death and his hatred for the orcs would fester like an open wound until the end of his days. The same couldn't be said for Jaina, who, despite her brother's death, still saw more in the orcs. With the Horde defeated, the Alliance decided to put those who surrendered into internment camps. When Jaina met Arthas in Lordaeron, on her way to Dalaran to begin her studies, the prince he immediately saw something special in Jaina. This was a girl who would not mind getting a snowball on the face or going for a swim on a hot day. Someone, unlike his sister, he could actually play with, so to spend more time with her, he offered to escort her to Dalaran. En route, they went out for a little adventure. They checked out one of the internment camps, and where Arthas saw nothing but monsters, Jaina wondered if the orcs truly belonged there. They had children, they looked so very sad and harmless, but Arthas simply snorted. These were the brutes who had destroyed Stormwind, wanted to render humankind extinct. They killed her brother for light's sake. There was no need to waste any pity on them. Their killers, even if in that moment they were lethargic, who could say what would happen if they were released? Jaina sighed softly in the darkness and did not answer. They went back to camp and continued her journey to Dalaran, arriving in the city that took her breath away. She thought it was a shame that they didn't usually allow visitors in the city, since it would be very nice to spend more time with Arthas, and the young prince, he agreed, would be very nice indeed. Now their childhood friendship, there would turn out to be seeds of love. As time passed, Jaina was eventually accepted as an apprentice to Archmage Antonidas, no small feat since he was the leader of the Kirin Tor. Under his tutelage, she grew stronger in her role as mage, while always keeping the words of wisdom from her father in her mind. He had instilled in her a solid understanding of her strengths and her weaknesses. It is as much of a mistake to underestimate yourself as to overestimate yourself. Dalen had once told her, false modesty is as bad as false pride. Know exactly what you are capable of at any moment and act accordingly. Any other plan is folly and could be deadly in battle. She knew full well that she was deft in the magical arts. She was intelligent and focused. She had learned much in her short time in Dalaran. On top of that, Antonidas would not have taken her on as an apprentice as a simply a charity case. Now in the meantime, Arthas, he continued to train to become a paladin from people like Muradin and Ufer, were also studying to one day rule Lordaeron. Their feelings for each other had also become more mature, yet there was another interest in Jaina, the high elf prince Kilfa Sunstrider, who openly courted her. He'd even invited her to come and visit him in Quelphalus. But unfortunately for the prince, Jaina, she found Kilfus to be more intimidating than someone that she could actually fall for. She felt no such intimidation when her longtime friend Arthas made a surprise visit, convincing them to let him in under the lie of wanting to study more about their history, the nature of magic, and other things that a king needed to know about. In truth, though, he was actually just there because he wanted to see Jaina, and studying was just extra. Their time together proved to him that he had always been right. Jaina was no porcelain doll. She was a girl to have fun with. A girl to have a snowball fight with. Someone that he could fall for. His arm encircled her as firmly as an iron band. He continued to touch her face, trailing strong, callous fingers down the curve of her cheek. Jaina, he said quietly. 
And she shivered, but not from the cold, not this time. It wasn't proper, she should move back. But instead, she lifted her face and closed her eyes. The kiss was gentle at first, soft and sweet. The first that Jaina had ever known. From that moment, the young lovers would steal moments here and there to sneak a kiss or a hug. Since openly loving each other, they would just feed the rumor mill. Kilfas, he would discover about the love affair and he wasn't exactly happy about it, but he would keep his mouth shut. Their relationship continued, and although there had been no public announcement, they both knew that their parents had spoken with one another and there was an agreement to let the courtship go on. So it was that Arthas, already beloved by his people, he was sent on more and more diplomatic matters, while Jaina, she was usually chosen to deliver messages from Dalaran to the capital city. Holidays and special celebrations, there were also cherished moments where they could be together. So as Arthas travelled to Jaina for the Midsummer Fire Festival, she joined him during the celebrations of Hollow's End. It's tradition during this time to burn the wickerman, and as a special surprise, Arthas introduced Jaina to his countrymen and asked her to give them all a show. Fire itself spawned from her hands, instantly setting the wickerman ablaze, and the crowd they cheered. Arthas leaned in close and whispered that she did a spectacular job, so good in fact that they'll demand her to come back each year to light the wickerman again. She turned to look at him and asked, Would that be a problem? Arthas caught his breath as he regarded her. She'd always been attractive to him, and he liked her from the moment they'd met. But now, he couldn't help but see her, quite literally, in a whole new light. It took a moment for him to find his voice, and he softly said, No, no, it wouldn't be a problem at all. They joined the celebration, until Arthas led Jaina back to his quarters. They kissed, and Jaina whispered, Are we ready for this? I am, if you are, he whispered back. There had been other opportunities for Arvis to share this with someone. There was Tarifa, for example, as he went to inspect the Orcus Gladiator Frau at the internment camp. She was sent by Blackmore to make the prince feel at home, yet he had declined her and she had not been the first. But Jaina was special and he was ready to bring this girl the rest of the way into his heart. Under the light of the Wickerman, they shared their love. And later, when the Wickerman had finally burned out, Jaina told her prince that no one seemed to be able to deny him anything. Least of all her, he clutched her to him then, a sudden cold shivering over him, though he had no idea why. Don't deny me, Jaina. Don't ever deny me, please. She looked up at him, eyes glittering in the cool moonlight. I never would, Arthas. Never. The two young lovers, they continued the relationship, and during the Feast of Winterville, it became clear that to the family, Jaina was becoming more and more than just the daughter of the ruler of Kaltiris. Arthas thought to himself that it was only the logical next step, yet the thought of it all, it made him feel uneasy. When Jaina jokingly told him that their children would almost certainly be blonde, the bomb exploded. He didn't feel ready for this. He was afraid that he was going to ruin it all. What if he would become a bad husband or a bad king? What if? And with those thoughts racing through his mind, he came to the conclusion that he wasn't ready yet. He wasn't ready for children. The weight of the crown, the relationship with Jaina. He tried to explain it all to his childhood friend, even if he himself didn't understand it all. She was hurt, of course. She'd even asked him if they were ready for this on the night that they came together. But she took a deep breath and steadied herself. It was all right. She honestly didn't understand it. But it was going to be all right, eventually. They still attended the ball together, despite how awkward and painful it felt. Arvis had dumped her, yet neither one of them really felt complete without the other, missing each other greatly. Turns out that they were not destined to stay apart though, as the events of Warcraft 3 are upon us, where the orc Thrall, he has broken his bonds of slavery, he liberated himself and his people from the internment camps, and then reformed the Horde. The Lich King was working hard on spreading the plague across the land, and bringing about another invasion from the Legion, a task for which he recruited Kelfuzad, who was a former wizard at Dalaran, a member of the Council of Six. Of course, this was not instantly known to the world. Reports had come in from people being ill, while the orc threats that had also people concerned. Medivh, the one responsible for bringing the orcs to Azeroth and start their first invasion, he was resurrected by his mother Aequin to try and make things right. He knew the Legion was plotting and scheming. He wanted the world to get ready for it, but King Terranus Menefil, he had already rejected him, so he tried his luck with the Kirentor and Archmage Antonidas. You must be wiser than the king. The end is near. I told you before, I'm not interested in this nonsense. Then I've wasted my time here. You can show yourself now, Jaina. He's gone. I'm sorry for eavesdropping, Master, but... <laughs> 
It's your inquisitive nature that I've come to rely on, child. That crazed fool's convinced that the world is about to end. I've heard the rumors of the plague spreading throughout the Northlands. Do you truly believe that the plague is magical in nature? It's a strong possibility. That's why I need you to travel there and investigate the matter. I've arranged for a special envoy to assist you. Yes, Master. I'll do my best. I know you will, child. Farewell. Jaina had learned nearly everything that Antonidas had a teacher. It was time to utilize those skills outside of the safety of the towers, as that special envoy that he arranged, that was actually Arthas Menefil. Their reunion was a little bit awkward at first, but soon enough it felt like old times. At night they spoke, not about endings or the way the Feast of Winterville ended, but about new beginnings. They loved each other dearly, and Arthas was now ready for more. Once they had dealt with this ugly business of the plague and saved the world together, they would have their marriage and children, and the future looked bright. Yet the present was still very dark. Step by step, they uncovered more about the plague that was being spread with the grain, the food that sustained their people. Not only that, it was not meant to just kill their people, it also turned them into the ravenous undead. Hello again, children. I am Kel'Thuzad, and I've come to deliver a warning. Leave well enough alone. Your curiosity will be the death of you. Are you responsible for this plague, Necromancer? Is this cult your doing? Yes. I ordered the Cult of the Dam to distribute the plagued grain. But the sole credit is not mine. What do you mean? I serve the Dreadlord, Malganus. He commands the scourge that will cleanse this land and establish a paradise of eternal darkness. And what exactly is this scourge meant to cleanse? Why, the living, of course. His plan is already in motion. Seek him out at Strathol if you need further proof. Kelfuzad has revealed himself and points Arthas and Jaina towards Strathholm and the Dreadlord Mauganus, while he himself is struck down. He's not too worried about that though, as all is going according to the Master's plan. As the days wore on, Jaina noticed a change in Arthas. Hate now dominated his thoughts. He pushed Jaina and his soldiers to the breaking point, forcing them onward and giving them little time to rest. Though the sorceress wanted to stop the plague just as much as Arthas did, she feared that the quest was taking a heavy toll on his psyche. She urged him to show their strength, but her words fell on deaf ears. The prince would not rest until his people were safe, and at Strathholm he would make a terrible choice. Rather than see his people be taken by the plague and be turned into their enemy, he would give them their final death. This entire city had already fallen to Melganus, and it had to be purged. Ufer the Lightbringer, he could not believe that Arthas would even consider that, but the prince had already made up his mind. Have you lost your mind, Arthas? Have I? Lord Uther, by my right of succession and the sovereignty of my crown, I hereby relieve you of your command and suspend your paladins from service. Arthas, you can't just- It's done! Those of you who have the will to save this land, follow me. The rest of you, get out of my sight. <laughs> You've just crossed a terrible threshold, Arthas. Jaina? I'm sorry, Arthas. I can't watch you do this. Jaina did not believe that they knew enough about the plague to make such a drastic choice. But when Arthas asked her if she'd rather die, or die and rise again, do things that in life she would never, ever have wanted to do, she could not help but agree. Yet, they could not make that choice for all of them. There were children in there, innocents. But Arthas shook his head. He was going to march into Strathholm and cut down every living man, woman and child within its walls. When she told him that she would not join him, shocking disbelief radiated from his face. She couldn't bear to look at him anymore. Gulping, her eyes filled with tears. Jaina turned away. Together with Ufer, she rode away, denying Arthas, who would go on to purge the city and follow Melganus to the cold heart of Northrend. Days later, she and Ufer returned to Strathholm. Much of the city was burned to a husk. Bodies littered the streets. It was even worse than what they had expected. 
as she looked over the ruins. Jaina cursed herself for not doing something to prevent the carnage. She could have used a magic to restrain Arthas, but she didn't. Her inaction had allowed the prince to commit an act that would haunt him for the rest of his days. And her own regret would weigh on Jaina in the years ahead. But time for regret would come later, as there were still massive threats to deal with. Don't be too hard on yourself, girl. You had nothing to do with this slaughter. Ufer went out to inform the king of what his son had done, while Jaina went back to Antonidas to inform them about the plague. Arthas would go on to pick up Frostmourne, sacrifice a piece of his soul to claim vengeance, and strike down Melganus. This action did make him a servant of the Lich King, and ironically, he would now serve the one he so desperately tried to fight. Arthas returned home as a Death Knight, murdered his own father, and claimed the kingdom. For the next step of their plans, they had to resurrect Kelfusaad. So they gathered his remains and ventured to Quelfalas, home to Kilfus and the Sun. Well, with the high home of the High Elf sect, they used the founder power to bring Kelfusaad back as a lich. Next, they made contact with Archimond and were ordered to bring about the Legion into the world. For that, they were going to need the Book of Medivh, which was kept within the city that Jaina loved so very much. It was kept within Daladan. With the Scourge approaching, Antonidas and the Kirintor, they readied themselves for battle. Despite preparations, a sense of impending doom fell over the city. The Scourge had brought Lordaeron to its knees. They had ripped out the heart of Quel'Thalas. These two nations were perhaps the mightiest in the Eastern Kingdoms, perhaps even the entire world. If they had fallen so easily, then what hope did Dalaran have? The question, it plagued Antonidas. His thoughts turned to the hooded figure, who had urged him to flee from the Eastern Kingdoms. He now realized that this stranger was no madman. He'd been right all along. Sadly, it was too late for him to go west. As the Kirintor's leader, he could not abandon Daladan, so it fell to Jaina to save innocent lives. She argued at first, of course. She didn't want to leave her mentor behind. Perhaps she could make a difference this time. Reason with Arthas, save him even. But after much discussion, she understood, just as Antonidas did, that the city could not hold out against the Scourge. If both of them died here, then who would heed the stranger's warning? It would be the last time that she would see the Archmage, as she worked tirelessly on rallying as many refugees as she could. Arvis and the Scourge sacked the city. Archimond is summoned, but there was still hope on the horizon. Not just the humans were warned by Medivh, there was also War Chief Thrall, and he immediately listened to the council. Both factions reached Kalimdor and trekked through the harsh lands of Stone Teller Mountains. The factions were going to need to join forces, work together against the threat of the Legion, but the history between the orcs and humans, that might make it a little bit difficult. Orcs, I knew that we were being followed. Defend yourselves! Stop! There will be no violence in this place. That voice. You're no oracle. You're the prophet. Very perceptive, son of Durotan. I am the prophet. And now that I've lured you all here, I will tell you what destiny holds. What the hell is going on here? Thrall, this is Jaina Proudmoor, leader of the survivors of Lordaeron. Survivors? What are you talking about? The invasion of the Burning Legion has begun. Lordaeron has already fallen, and now the demons come to invade Kalimdor. Only together, united against the Shadow, will you be able to save this world from the flame. Unite with them? Are you mad? Have you heard nothing that I've said? The Legion comes to undo history and end all life. Thrall, your friend Hellscream has already fallen under the demon's influence. Soon he and your whole race will be lost forever. No. I'll die before I let that happen. Then you must rescue him immediately. He is the key to the destiny I promised you. However, you will need help. Wait, this is insane. You can't possibly expect me destiny to- Destiny is at hand, young sorceress. The time to choose has come. For the fate of all who live, humanity must join forces with the Horde. Thrall was raised as a slave, as a gladiator, a tool for war. But the kindness of one human female, Tarifa Foxton, it showed him that not all humans were monsters. When he liberated his people and reformed the Hordes, he did not do so as the Horde of old. Honor, uncorrupted, carving out a piece of the world for the people to live in, that was their goal. 
Now corruption has found him again, as the Garomash Hellscream ended up in conflict with the Night Elves and Scenarius. He once again drank demon blood, which did give him the strength to overcome his foes, but also surrendered his will to Manoroth once again. Now Jaina, she first considered it madness to join force with the Hordes, but she eventually saw the wisdom in Medea's words. During her studies, she had learned fragments of knowledge about the Burning Legion. All of it had terrified her. If a demonic invasion was truly unfolding, it would be foolish not to do everything in her power to stop the Legion. Failure would mean more than Jaina's own death. It would mean that everyone who had sacrificed their lives to defend Lord Ron, all of them had died for nothing. They made an uneasy truce and did not completely trust each other, but they were willing to put aside old hatreds and work together for the time being. Their union would mean the salvation of Gromash, who in turn sacrificed himself to liberate all of their people from their demonic enslavement. Horde and Alliance then met with Saranda, Melfurion and the Night Elves, who had stood against the Legion millennia ago. A bold and dangerous plan was formed between them, while their forces bought as much time as possible, Melfurion and his druids would work their magics on the enchantments on the World Tree of Nordrasil. These blessings were placed there by the Dragon Aspects, and the reason why the Night Elves were immortal. Blowing up the tree, that would have dire consequence for the race, but the defenders had little choice. Thousands of them died that day, but they did not die in vain. By the time that Archimonde reached Nordrasil, Melfjorn and his druids, they completed their work. The roots will heal in time, as will the entire world. The sacrifices have been made. Just as the orcs, humans, and night elves discarded their old hatreds and stood united against a common foe, so did nature herself rise up to banish the shadow forever. Countless wisps emerged from the forest. They closed in around our command, channeling their energies into the world tree and igniting the enchantments within. And so, our command was defeated, and the invasion of the Legion that came to an halt, but their plans and their schemes they echoed on. Medivh's task was completed, and he vanished. Arthas would merge with the Lich King and sit upon the frozen throne. The Night Elves would have to learn how to live with the now mortal lives, while Fro and Jaina, they set out to find new lands to settle in. The Hordes, they decided to settle in the harsh, rugged land near the Baron's eastern shore, and they named the new nation Durotar in honor of Thrall's father Durotan. The Alliance refugees, led by Jaina Proudmoore, they settled in the Dustwallow Marsh and established a seaside city named Fedamore Isle. Jaina and Thrall, they continued to communicate with each other, and the uneasy truce, slowly but surely, it developed into something more permanent. Both leaders declared that they would respect the other's territory and refrain from any acts of aggression. Though their peace would last for years, the history of the world, the history between humans and orcs, that would make it rather difficult to maintain. Hopefully we've made it in time. You've got to get word back to Thrall that- I don't understand. What's this all about? Those marines. I know who they are, Rexar. They're- It's too late. He's here.
Jaina. Bless the stars, I found you at last. When I heard that Lordaeron fell, I despaired. But I knew you'd find a way to escape. I... What is this? An ogre? Father, wait. Father? The Horde is no longer our enemy. The orcs have their own kingdom now, we- You have always been naive, my daughter. You aren't old enough to remember what these monsters did to our homeland. The orcs and their kin cannot be trusted. They must be exterminated like the mongrels they are. I won't let you do it, Father. You don't understand. I understand more than you suspect, my dear. Perhaps in time, you will too. Seize them all! None other than Jaina's own father, Admiral Dalen Proudmoore, would come around and reignite the fighting. He did not see the Hordes to be any different than the ones he fought with during the First and the Second War. He saw them as the same monsters that took the life of his son, not as those that showed valor and honor, stood with his daughter against the Legion for the safety of the world. They wanted the same thing that Jaina and many of her followers did, an end to the cycle of hatred between the Horde and the Alliance. The bloodshed between the factions, that was merely a distraction, since threats like the Scourge and others, they still lingered on Azeroth. The world's noble races, they needed to be united in strength to focus on their true enemies. And while Jaina did her best to convince her father of that fact, he refused to listen. This forced his daughter to make an impossible choice. Thrall, Rexar, I come in peace. You must believe me, I had no part in my father's plans. I wish none of this had ever happened. I, I don't know what to do. We've bled together on many battlefields, Jaina. We've faced untold perils as allies. But your father threatens the security of our nation and the very future of my people. You know how this has to end. I know, Thrall. Do what you must. There is a goblin shipyard on a nearby island that could provide you with warships of your own. With those, you could scatter the blockade surrounding Theramor. But please, spare my men if you can. My father will try to use them against you, but they're the only real family I'll have left when this is over. Please do this. For me. We'll do all we can, Jaina. You have my word. Now you'd better make yourself scarce. The battle's about to begin. The ruler of Ferramor stepped aside, while Rexar, Thrall, and the Horde, they destroyed the blockade, they entered her city, and confronted her father. This is not the Horde you remember, old man. We have no interest in conquest or murder. We have paid for the sins of our forebears in blood. Can your blood atone for genocide, Orc? Your horde killed countless innocents with its rampage across Stormwind and Lordaeron. Do you really think you could just sweep all that away and cast aside your guilt so easily? No, your kind will never change, and I will never stop fighting you. By fang and claw. Over. Stand down, humans. Father, why wouldn't you listen? Above all else, Jaina, he was a proud warrior. Remember him as such. Duratar is now safe. We have no further quarrel with these humans. We will leave your isle in peace, Jaina. I pray we never have to come here again. Farewell. With her father's death, the survivors of Dalen's fleet, they sail back to the Eastern Kingdoms. And despite her thinking that those in Ferramor are the only family that she has left, that's not exactly true. Her mother and her kingdom of Kaltiris were there as well. They weren't exactly happy to hear that Dalen's rescue mission, that it had turned into one of betrayal, with his own daughter conspiring with the leaders of the Horde, stepping aside and allowing them to murder him. His people cried out for vengeance for his death, but the rest of the Alliance... They did not seek it. The plague upon death and Lordaeron, it already left the Alliance reeling, and its other leaders had little pity for Dalen Proudmoor, who had launched the war of aggression on his own authority. In fury, the people of Kal Tiris isolated themselves from the rest of the Alliance. But their anger, it was not focused on King Varian Rin or any of the other Alliance leaders. Instead, they grew to hate Jaina Proudmoor, the daughter who had betrayed her family. Beware, beware. The daughter of the sea. 
the price of peace. It was a high one to pay. But Frau and Jaina, they did their very best to make it work, despite manipulations from outside sources, like demons and the Burning Blade clan. Their people had to overcome old hatreds in order to work together, and deciding the lay of the land, who gets what, it often caused friction. But the war chief of the Horde and the leader of Fedamor, they pushed on with cool heads in a world that was full of turmoil. Four years have passed since the mortal races banded together and stood united against the might of the Burning Legion. Though Azeroth was saved, the tenuous pact between the Horde and the Alliance has all but evaporated. The drums of war thunder once again. It is around this time that the Black Dragon Onyxia, she decided to manipulate events in Stormwind and cause a bit of trouble. She manipulated the House of Nobles in not paying the Stonemasons Guild for the work on rebuilding Stormwind after the original Horde destroyed it, which then led to riots in the streets, the formation of the Defiant Brotherhood and the death of Varian's wife Tiffin. The depression that set over the king, it made him an easy target for Onyxia's manipulations, but one ray of light was able to break her hold, his son Anduin Lane Rin. Which meant that Onyxia had to try something else. This time, she used the Defiant Brotherhood to kidnap the king as he was making his way to Fadamor for a diplomatic mission. She used the magics to split him into two beings, with the idea of taking out his stronger willed side and leaving his weak willed one on the throne as an easy puppet to manipulate. Unfortunately for her, the strong willed one was able to make an escape. He would wash up on the shores of Duratar and be enslaved by Rhaegar Urfury, who turned him into a gladiator, and then his journey of trying to regain his memories, figure out who he was, could begin. That path would eventually take him to Fadamor, and although Jaina and Varian had met before, were friendly with each other, she didn't actually recognize him at first, but she did sense something familiar. The magic that had sundered Varian's spirits, it had also enveloped him in an aura of dark magic. These energies, it hid his identity from everyone, even his former friends. Jaina then turned to her chamberlain, the legendary sorceress Aquin. The same Aquin who had resurrected her son Medivh, had now found a way to Fedamor for help. Together, they called on the magic to pierce the veil over Varian's mind and reveal his identity. Turned out that he was no slave, nor was he a gladiator. He was the rightful king of Stormwinds. With that knowledge, he returned home to reveal the truth to his people, but his weak-willed sides also believed that he was the rightful king. There was no imposter at play here, just two sides of the same being split by dark magic. Onyxia then reveals herself and kidnaps Anduin, and then takes him to her lair very close to Fedamor. Despite their differences, the two variants felt the same love for their child, so the quest was on. Back at Fedamor, Jaina helps the two variants remember exactly what happened to them, and make them understand that they are one and the same, divided, where one became Logush, the champion gladiator, the other was ransomed back to Stormwind and further ensorcelled, while still finding the resolve to break free. For such formidable twins, she had a twin gift. The magical elven blades called Shalator and Elamain, these were forged during the War of the Ancients over 10,000 years ago and then wielded by the twin warriors Vorillian and Lovellian. Between the two of them, they had twice the strength, twice the wisdom, twice the will to strike at Onyxia's dark heart. Sadly, they never really explained how these blades came to be in Jaina's possession, but all the same, their party then rode out and entered the dragon's lair. Together, they were able to overcome the threats waiting inside, and during the battle, Onyxia's attack luckily enough reforged the King of Stormwind into one single being, with his twin blades now turned into Shalemane. The line of Stormwind's kings has been restored. The dragon is slain, her head displayed in Stormwind for all to see, and young Endwin Rin is saved. Now with the corruption of the Black Dragonflight removed from Stormwind, and the events of the Burning Crusade proving that the Horde and Alliance, they can work together, Jaina then decided to push forward with the planned summit at Fedamor to try and get some sort of peace going. Now as you might imagine, this was quite an undertaking with the history between the factions. Someone like Varian had lost his father, Stormwind and so many others during the war against the original Hordes. While the Hordes, they clearly remember the oppression and the time within the internment camps. It was not going to be easy to sit around the table and negotiate, but wiser and cooler heads, they gave sound advice and at least they gave it a try. Oddly enough, the meeting actually went quite well. There was Gerar's Hellscream, son of Gromash Hellscream, that joined Thrall back to Azeroth from the homeworld of Outland, who actually wondered why the Orc should make concessions when they had the strength to take what they needed. Anduin simply asked, why waste your warriors and resource in battle, when a few words would bring you greater profits? 
Despite all odds, cooperation between the people, it seemed no longer like an idealistic dream, but a definite possibility. Was it not for Cho'Gall and the Twilight Hammer clan? Their aim was bringing about the end of the world. They worshipped the old gods and reveled in chaos. Peace between factions, that did not really line up with their goals, so they used Corona Half Orkan, the same orc who murdered Varian's father, to attack Fedamor and cause chaos. Both sides were quick to point fingers at each other, and although the attack was repelled, the meeting was definitely a bust, and the leaders they left Fedamor to focus on the new threat that was rising. Arthas the Lich King was ready to finish what was started, and this time his once beloved Jaina would not run away. The Alliance and the Horde ventured into the cold heart of Northrend to deal with the threat of the Scourge. Things seemed to be going quite nicely, but at the Wrath Gates, all hell broke loose. Both are four dragon, seen by Varian as a brother, and the one who advised Anduin and helped rule the kingdom while Varian was kidnapped. He was the one who led the charge for the alliance. With Draenor Saurfang, son of Varok Saurfang, he was leading the horde to quickly back them up. They ushered their challenge to the Lich King, but Arthas, with Frostmourne in hand, he was no pushover. Dranosh was the first to be struck down, his soul like so many others claimed by the blade, but that was just the start. What? <laughs> Did you think we had forgotten? Did you think we had forgiven? Behold now, the terrible vengeance of the Forsaken! Sylvanas. Death to the Scourge! And death to the Living! Round Apothecary Putris, together with the Dreadlord Varimafras, they decided that the time had come to betray Sylvanas Windrunner. They struck out at the living and the dead, and they took the Undercity away from the Queen. Sylvanas had her people develop this plague to claim vengeance for what Arvis had done to her, destroy her city of Quelphalus, and turn her into a banshee. Now following the disaster at the Wrath Gate, Fral, he sent a summon to Queen Sylvanas, but the Queen was already on her way to meet him. She told the Warchief that she had been forced to flee from her home, and as they were gonna get her to plan a counterattack, Jaina convened with their group. Varian, already not too happy with the Horde at this point, he was prepared to lay all responsibility for the Wrath Gate at the Horde's feet, unless Jaina could convince him otherwise. So it was that Sylvanas told Jaina of what she knew, and she promised that she would exterminate the traitors who had killed thousands on both sides, including both of Four Dragon. When Jaina brought this news to Varian, he greeted Sylvanas' explanation with suspicion. But whether or not the bench queen was lying, Varian, he saw an opportunity. For the moment, the Undercity was not under Horde's control. Perhaps it was time for the Alliance to reclaim the old nation of Lordaeron. Each faction launched separate offensive against the Undercity. With the Hordes, they went for Varimafras, the mastermind behind the coup. While the Alliance, they stormed through the city sewers in search of Putrids. Both sides, they claimed their victory, but the tensions between the Alliance and Horde were about to escalate. I was away for too long. My absence cost us the lives of some of our greatest heroes. Trash like you and this evil witch were allowed to roam free, unchecked. But the time has come to make things right, to disband your treacherous kingdom of murderers and thieves. Putris was the first strike. Many more will come. I've waited a long time for this, Thrall. For every time I was thrown into one of your damned arenas, for every time I killed a green-skinned aberration like you, I could think of only one thing. What our world could be without you and your twisted horde. It ends now, Warchief. Attack for Stormwind! For Bovar! Varian, no! Stop! <laughs> It ends like it began. All that we have fought for in this world is lost. The hopes and dreams carried by my father and mother, by Doomhammer, gone. Varian wanted Horde blood, while Thrall, he sees all his hopes and dreams of peace with the Alliance simply evaporate. 
the Wrath Gate didn't do any good to the tensions between the factions, but full scale war that was averted for the moment. In the days to come, the Horde and the Alliance armies they would frequently clash with each other in North Rent, but only in small and short lived skirmishes. The real threat, the real danger of the Lich King, that was still looming before them, but another far more ancient evil that was hanging out in Ulduar, quite enjoying the chaos of battle. It was Bran Bronzebeard and the Explorers League that discovered the Oxeron. Such a threat, it could not be ignored, so Ronan, leader of the Kirantor, he called upon the Alliance and the Horde to unite once more. It was his hope that they would see fit to set aside the differences again, if only for one more battle. How? How could we have missed this until now? <clears throat> ah, King Varian, thank you for coming on such short notice. What's this all about, Ronan? I've... I've called you here to ask for your help. While our efforts against the Lich King press on, Bran here has brought us frightening news of the horrors beneath Ulduar and of its dark prisoner. Prisoner? Huh? With its binding shattered, its influence unchecked, it's gonna come after us, and we're gonna be the prisoners. You can see now what we're up against. If this evil is not stopped, <gasps> And the armies of the oh, Death no. God will march on our doorstep. You'll have to excuse me. <laughs> well, what do you propose we do? Thrall, what are you doing here so soon? The summons sounded dire, Jaina. What's happened? <sighs> Bran Bronzebeard's forces assaulted the gates of Uduar. They battled the Iron Lords and their cursed minions. Permeating the great halls, stirring in their minds, chilling their blood. He said, the horror that the Titans imprisoned so long ago, Yog saron has awakened. Hmm. I want to see this dwarf, Garrosh, to see the fear in his eyes. Then we'll know if he's telling the truth. No, no, wait! We are going to need all the help we can get if we are- Thrall! What? What are they doing here? Let me explain! I thought I smelled the stench of Alliance pigs! Control yourself! You want my blood? Come then, dog! <laughs> He's mine! deal in this conflict, but we stand to lose everything if we do not stop fighting and work together! A true war chief would never partner with cowards. At the Wrathgate, the Horde's partnership killed more of our men than the Scourge. I'm done with your Horde. May this Death God take you You disappoint me, Garrosh. <laughs> the old god is laughing, toying with us. Who will be our hope? Who will stand and face Yog Saron? Well, that would be us, of course. Despite our commanders not willing to work together, the Horde and the Alliance, they still stepped up to the challenge and they took on the threats within Ulduar, including Yog Saron. With that out of the way, we could refocus on the Lich King, but only the best and brightest would be allowed to join this assault. Tyrion Fordring, wielding a mighty Ashbringer, he held a little tournament to decide who was ready for the final war. Now you might wonder, why not just send out our full force to assault Icecrown Citadel, but that is exactly what the Lich King wanted. He was holding his forces back, daring his enemies to come to him. Frostmourne hungers, and any soldier that we'd lose would be an additional one fighting for the enemy. No, 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 no. It was much better to have his small surgical strike force to punch a hole in the Citadel's defenses and fight away to the Lich King. With the chosen few selected to join the ranks, it was time for our final assault. But while our main force was battering down the door, a small team joined either Sylvanas or Jaina into the Frozen Halls. 
for the Alliance is the SI7, who've gathered information about some sort of private sanctum of the Lich King within the Halls of Reflection. Now Jaina, she can sense powerful magic hidden away within those halls. With any luck, we'll find something that will enable us to defeat the Scourge once and for all. We move through the Forge of Souls into the Pit of Seron, losing as many troops as we save along the way. The Scourge is no joke to take on, but we do find some juicy information, since apparently Frostmourne is left unguarded within the Halls of Reflection. Death becomes our target, and while Jaina communes with the spirits locked away within the blade, an old friend appears. Jaina, could it truly be you? Uther! Dear Uther! I... I'm so sorry. Uther the Lightbringer. He was slain when Arthur returned home to Lord Ron, and he lets us know that there must always be a Lich King. He thinks that the small part of Arthas, which is still left inside the Dark Being, that that is all that's keeping the Scourge from annihilating Azeroth. A small, dwindling presence. Perhaps there's still hope, Jaina believes. Perhaps there's something left of the man that she once loved so dearly. Before we can say anything more, the Lich King shows up, leaving us behind with the ghost of the past. Well, Jaina, she quickly rushes after him. You won't deny me this, Arthas. I must know. I must find out. Yet the man that you once knew is truly lost and gone. There is only the Lich King now. His might far beyond anything that we can deal with. Through the tunnels, we run for our lives, knocking down ice wall after ice wall, until we reach a dead end. <laughs> Nowhere to run. You're mine now. Fire! Fire! Quickly! Climb aboard. We mustn't tarry here. There's no telling when this whole mountainside will collapse. Forgive me, heroes. I should have listened to Uther. I... I had to see for myself. To look into his eyes one last time. I am sorry. We now know what must be done. I will deliver this news to King Varian and High Lord Fordring. And what must be done? That is enter Icecrown Citadel and take on the mightiest forces that the Lich King has to offer. Both the Alliance and Hordes, they figure out that Bolvar is actually still alive. He did not die at the Raw of Gates and is currently being tortured by the Lich King. Perhaps if they can save him, they can quell the unrest between the factions, so the race is on to save the High Lords. By the might of the Lich King. Another victim at the Raw of Gate, Draenor Saurfang. He also makes a return, but since his soul was claimed by Frostmourne, he is already a Death Knight. That was Sourfang's boy, the Horde Commander at the Wrath Gate. Such a tragic end. What in the... There in the distance! Soldiers, fall in! Looks like the Horde are coming to take another shot! Don't force me hand, Orc. We can't let you pass. Behind you lies the body of my only son. Nothing will keep me from him. I... I can't do it. Get back on your ship and we'll spare your life. Stand down, Muradin. Let a grieving father pass. No co kills Ilnok, Atar. I will not forget this kindness. I thank you, Highness. I... I was not at the Wrathgate. But the soldiers who survived told me much of what happened. Your son fought with honor. He died a hero's death. He deserves a hero's burial. <laughs> J 
Jaina, why are you crying? It was nothing, your majesty. Just... I'm proud of my king. It appears that Endwin's and Janus' advice to Varian to see the orcs as more than just the monsters of the past, it's finally rubbing off on him and he shows respect to Saurfang. This would be Varian's start of the journey of change, to become more balanced after being separated by Onyxia. But at the moment, we still have a king to dethrone. Our forces are able to bring down anything that the Lich King has to throw at us. Even Arthas is brought low, but sadly, Jaina didn't show up during the encounter. It's Bolvar Fordragon who picks up the role of Lich King. He becomes the Jailer of the Damned. Now we have claimed victory over the Scourge, and amongst the spoils of war, we find a memento of Arthas's past, namely Jaina's locket. Once it held her image, he always wore it close to his heart. What's this? He... He kept it. All this time, he kept it. I knew. I sensed a part of him still alive, trapped, struggling. Oh, Arthas. Perhaps, perhaps he might someday remember what he once was. By the light, may he at last find rest. Free from the icy grip of that terrible blade. She could not bear to keep it. So instead, she plays an enchantment upon it and gives it back to us so we may use it to teleport to Daladan. So far, Jaina has been a voice of peace on both sides, trying to make the factions come together. Her mindset was very similar to that of Anduin, and they grew very fond of each other, the prince seeing her as an aunt. Together, they tried to keep Varian Rin under control. As the king's history with the Horde, it's seen nothing but pain and suffering. The murder of his father, the fall of Stormwind, enslaved as a gladiator. Varian's time has definitely been rough, and being split up and reformed by Onyxia, that has left him unbalanced. Rage often boiled to the surface, striking out not only on the battlefield, where it actually suited him, but also towards those that he loved. A good example of this is just before the Cataclysm happens. This was after the war against the Lich King and the Alliance and Horde, they come together and agreed to end hostilities towards each other. There was a ceremony in Stormwind to honor the thousands who had died in the war, but Night Elf Sentinels, they showed up with dire news. The Horde had attacked Ashenville and the treaty had been broken. It wasn't a mere act of aggression from the past, expected bumps in the roads for the treaty. This was a slaughter. They've been unable to recover the bodies because they've been methodically chopped into several pieces. And those pieces were taken away by carrion eaters. This was after they'd been skinned and they were not sure if they were alive for that or not. The skins were hung like linens from a nearby tree and on that tree, written in elven blood, were the horde symbols. Varian quickly called for Thrall's head. The orcs had done this, the horde had to pay, but Jaina threw back at him that they didn't know if this was the horde. She had fought and bled with Thrall, could not believe that he would order this attack. Is Varian then responsible for all the humans, like the Defiers Brotherhood that had taken his wife's life? This comment pissed off Varian, Logash came out to play, to play dirty, and he asked her, what if he's right and she's wrong? She had been a very poor judge of character in the past, and now it was he throwing Arthas at her, but none of them could have predicted what he would become. This may be, but Varian wasn't making the same mistake twice as she was. If she had seen what Arthas would become, would she have tried to stop him? Would she have the guts to kill her lover? Or would she have stood by, peace at all costs, a mewling little pacifist who... Father. The word was uttered by Enduin. Shock and bitter disappointment in his father cleared on his face. Like I said, Varian's rage, it hurt those around him. And while he would work on trying to find balance, harness that rage inside, Jaina continued negotiations and tried to work both sides towards a brighter future. Yet with the world in turmoil, one of her best allies in this quest, Warchi Thrall, he decided that the time had come to return to his ancestral lands to figure out what was going on. He then decided to leave Garrosh Hellscream behind as Warchief of the Horde, despite several voices telling him that this was a very bad idea, including Garrosh himself. He didn't listen, he had made up his mind, and he left the son of Gromash in charge. Now you might remember that Garrosh was quite against the idea of working together with the Alliance and taking on the mantle of leadership that only encouraged him to indulge in his warlike ways. He believed that the Horde was being too timid. The war had depleted the resources, the elemental turmoil only made things worse. After Thrall departed, 
Gerrard turned his gaze northwest to the lush forest of Ashenville. It was a land of plenty, and it was well within the Horde's reach. Most of the region, it belonged to the Night Elves, but that did not stop Gerrard from sending troops into the woodlands. He was not interested in asking the Alliance for resources or trading for them. Why would he do that, when he could simply take what he wanted by force? The Horde's new incursion into Ashenville, it enraged the Alliance. Tensions between the factions flared, and open war seemed inevitable. Some of the Horde members, they welcomed these bold and aggressive maneuvers, but Cairn Bloodhoof, leader of the Tauren, did not. He did everything he could to reason with the acting warchief and prevent the bloodshed. In Cairn's eyes, Garrosh was leading the Horde down a dangerous path, one that would inevitably destroy it. The warchief did not listen to his wisdom, and so Cairn spoke the only language that the orc would understand. He challenged Garrosh to a Makora, a ritualistic duel. Before a crowd of onlookers, the Tarn and the orc, they fought for the future of the Horde itself. On one side stood the promise of a peaceful future, on the other the promise of blood and conquest. Garrosh, you are not fit to rule the Horde. Magatha Grimtotem was the reason that blood and conquest won that day. She had dreamed of seizing a racist capital, Thunderbluff, and asserted control over all of the Tauren. Only Cairn had stood in her way, so she had secretly, without his knowledge, coated Garrus' weapon Gorhal with poison. So it was that the Tauren, who had lived his life with honor, died betrayed. After that duel, Magatha led a coup into Thunderbluff and she seized the city. Yet her victory was short-lived, since Cairn saw Bane Bloodhoof, he was warned of the attack and he made his escape. He didn't exactly know who he could trust at that point. Was perhaps Garrosh in on the betrayal? So instead, they turned to the one that the former warchief had trusted, Lady Jaina at Fadamore. It was around this time that Magni Bronzebeard on the Alliance side, he used an ancient titan ritual to also figure out what was going on with the land, and he turned himself into a crystal. His daughter Moira, they made use of this opportunity to take over and lock down Ida Forge, including Enduin, who was visiting the dwarves. Luckily, Jaina had given him a hearthstone to visit her at Fadamore, which he now used to teleport out of the city right into a meeting between Bane and Jaina. Now these three characters had a very similar mindset towards the world, they got along quite nicely and Jaina decided to financially aid Bane in retaking the city. Magatha was foolishly hoping for Garrosh to support her coup, but the war chief he could not appreciate the dishonor that she bestowed upon him. Now he would never know who would have won in a fair fight, so he left it on her own. Bane retook the city and he decided to banish her and the Grim Totem that stayed at her side. Meanwhile, Thrall learned more about his shamanistic roots, and Deathwing broke out of the world, starting the expansion of the Cataclysm. Jaina didn't exactly play a massive role in fighting Deathwing, besides showing up at Thrall's wedding, but with a new warchief in charge, a world in turmoil and resources scarce, the war between the Alliance and Horde started to pick up. With Garrus' wish of defeating the Night Elves and conquering the whole of Kalimdor, the humans of Fadamor, they send out their armies and try to establish a military line between the Night Elves and Fadamor. They didn't exactly get the results they expected, with events like Stone Teller Mountains, the Barons and Camp Terrajo, but the dream of peace, it seemed further away than ever. Varian completed his journey of becoming whole, while accepting the Worgen into the Alliance and defeating Garrosh in Ashenvale, which earned him the title of High King of the Alliance. They were unified, like never before. Thrall, now going by the name Goel, he united with the Dragon Aspects, and together they were able to save the world from Deathwing. They defeated him, the Old Gods, and prevented the Hour of Twilight. Today's victory belongs to all who stood against the Shadow. You are Azeroth's true guardians, and the future of this world is in your hands. For the dawning of the Age of Mortals has begun. And what do the mortals do? They start an even bigger war, of course, as Garrosh, he now focuses his gaze on Fadamore. If they wanted to secure Kalimdor, then they had to wipe out this human port, so the Horde forces, they gathered, and they got ready for their march. Jaina meets up with Goel to see if there isn't anything that he can do to stop this. His duties to the world, they were done. He had set out and accomplished the near impossible. But Goel, he was now the leader of the Urban Ring, and the world, they still needed their aid to heal. Despite what Garrosh had done, like Cairn and Ashenville, the Alliance had not been perfect either. There had been innocence, but even Jaina could not place the blame for the current tension squarely at Garrosh's feet. Not all the attacks had been initiated by the Horde, and she knew the truth of his words. There were times when she felt that her words just fell on deaf ears. The only one who seemed to truly be interested in forging a lasting peace, that was Enduin Rin. 
and he's just 14 at the time, it's difficult to try to be a diplomat and work for real solid results when the other side won't acknowledge reason anymore. I'm sorry, what? Thrall and me? Ugh, who keeps spreading that filthy rumor? Besides, everyone knows I prefer blue over green. Goel decides to do nothing about Gerush, and he stays on to lead the Earthen Ring. While Jaina, she returns home, where she's visited by the Blue Dragon Calicos. His Blue Dragon Flight, they've lost the Focusing Iris, which is a powerful magical item previously held within a Nexus, and he's looking for help to try and track it down. Jaina turns out to not only be a great help with this, the two of them also develop feelings for each other, but times of romance, they would have to be put on hold as Gerush leads the Horde towards Fedamore. Northwatch Hold is their first goal to claim. Despite some of the leaders amongst the Horde, not being too happy about sending their sights on Fedamore, they believe that this would just piss off the rest of the Alliance and cause more trouble than it was worth. They still stuck to their honor though and followed their war chief lead, if not for the sake of their people. Northwatch was a tough battle, but Garrosh had some tricks up his sleeve. He had his shamans summon molten giants to make quick work of the enemy, which Bane couldn't exactly appreciate. The world was still healing from the cataclysm. This was an affront to the Earth Mother. What was Garrosh thinking? Not only that, he was also struggling with the upcoming battle, as he remembered how Jaina had been there for him when he needed aid the most. He decided that although he would not shrug away from his duties to the Horde, he would not let Jaina be cut unawares. Perhaps he could save some innocent lives by sending her a messenger, a warning that the Horde was on the move. Some might call this an act of treason, but I can't imagine Garrosh being too mad about it, as it worked quite well for his plans. He actually decided to hold his troops back, giving Jaina the time to gather as many allies as she could for the defense of Fedamore. The Alliance, the Kirantor, including their leader Ronan, and even the Blue Dragon Caligos, they all offered their aid to Lady Jaina Proudmore. When Garrosh did finally send his troops out, they stood shoulder to shoulder trying to hold the line. The Horde breached their gates because of a traitor from within. Tail and Songweaver, recommended by Ronan himself to join them, he actively worked against them and the gate splintered. The traitor was taken captive and would later be saved by members of the Horde, but the battle at Fedamore, it wasn't over quite yet. Kaelic dropped trees and boulders from the sky to block the entrances, he was trying to trap the Horde within. In response, they had no choice but to call the retreat, and Jaina couldn't believe it. They had won. They had actually won the day. We're gonna turn this place into a sinkhole! <laughs> As it turns out, it was the Horde who had taken the focusing iris and they had turned it into a bomb. They could see it coming of course, but their flyers they'd been neutralized by the Horde, and Kaelic he was blown out of the sky with cannon fire. Ronin could see the bomb approaching, and decided to make the ultimate sacrifice by drawing the bomb onto himself and into the protective magics. This would not hold the explosion, it would not save everyone, but it was the best that he could do. Jaina tried to protest, tried to argue, tried to find a way for him to not kill himself. She would not abandon him, maybe together they could divert it, but it was already too late. The Sky Galleon released its cargo. She felt herself being both pushed and pulled towards the still whirling portal entrance, a portal held by Ronin. She shouted in protest, tried to tug herself free, and craned her neck to look back just in time to see hell. The world went absolutely white. The tower shattered, Ronin's body standing tall, arms outstretched as he glared defiantly at his fate, turned suddenly purple. He was frozen in time for a fraction of a heartbeat. Then he exploded in a cloud of lavender ash. As the portal world closed and Jaina was dragged further and further away, she saw a violet ocean of arcane energy wash over Fedamore. Cries of utter, absolute, depthless terror assaulted her ears. And then she knew no more. Ronan's heroic sacrifice, it saved the life of his beloved wife Risa Windrunner, as well as Chandris Fedamoon, Caligos and Jaina. But many at Fedamore were caught in the explosion. Ronan himself, of course, Archmage Teravush, Tira Salan, who traveled all the way from Outland, as word of Jaina's great deeds and efforts for peace, they'd even reach Shefrev City. Admiral Tarlan Aubrey and Terry Cog, General Marcus Jonathan, for many years a stalwart guardian at the Stormwind Gates, Amara Leeson and Toda Windermere, Paint, a bodyguard assigned to Jaina by Tyrande as they followed the Battle of Mount Hygel, Tedda Stoutblow, Horan Repmane, and Kindy Sparkshine, Jaina's new and young apprentice. When Bane looked upon the explosion, tears ran down his muzzle, and he made no effort to wipe them away. He stood surrounded by throngs of cheering horde, but as he looked around, he saw, illuminated by the ghostly arcane glow, faces that wore his own expression of shock and revulsion. Did none of them see? Bane couldn't understand it, 
So many, too many seemed happy at beholding the dead city and crowded by corpses of people who had died in a horribly and painful fashion. They were happy at being tricked into a battle against Fedamor, when all along Garrosh had had the means to win without sacrificing a single horde life. Bane was not sure which act he despised more. So Jaina was saved by Ronin, but the diplomat, the peace seeker that we knew, she is gone. The transformation was visible for all to see, as the explosion of the bomb it had turned her hair white with a single blonde streak of the past. Her eyes too were glowing white, but on the inside the pain was unbearable. When she returned to Fedamor to look for any survivors, she saw the corpses of those who had fought with her eerily floating in the air. Not even the reds had survived the attack, and her new apprentice, Kindy Sparkshine, she crumbled into violet dust at her touch. Jaina screamed. She screamed in utter horror, frantically gathering up the crystalline powder that was all that remained of a smart, lively young woman. She screamed in loss, in grief, in guilt, and then most of all in rage. Rage at the hordes. Rage at Garrosh Hellscream. Rage at those who followed him. Rage at Bane Bloodhoof, who had warned her, but had nonetheless permitted this to happen. Had perhaps known that this was going to happen. Her screaming turned to raking, hoarse sobs that ripped her throat. She kept lifting handfuls of the purple sand, trying to hold on to Kindy, her sobbing increasing as the dust persisted in trickling through her fingers. This wasn't war. This wasn't even murder. This was obliteration done at a comfortable distance, killing in the most brutal and cowardly fashion Jaina could conceive of. She did not find any survivors, but she did encounter a group of orcs which were poking around the debris, laughing to each other, looting of the dead. No one can protect you! Kill the proud moor wench! And bring me that Your bomb! Your people are despicable cowards, orc! You're nothing more than rabid dogs, and you will be put down! Brave words, mage! I'll spit in your face when you beg for mercy! You spit on mercy? Then you will have none! You want carnage? Garrosh will get more blood than he ever bargained for! Uh, I'll bring the war chief your head! She recovered the focusing Iris and set out to gain allies in her quest for vengeance, but she found rejection on all sides. Funny enough, where in the past she was the one who had to hold Varian back, now the roles were quite reversed. The king, he had found his balance, but make no mistake, they would make the horde pay, but they had to do it on their terms. They couldn't just rush in, they had to be smarter than that, rebuild, gather their forces. But Jaina believed that with the focusing Iris, they could destroy Orgrimmar just as surely as they had destroyed Fedamor. But to make it happen, they needed to act now, when their armies were foolishly gathered together in Orgrimmar. Endwin tried to reason with Auntie Jaina. Surely not everyone amongst the Horde agreed with what happened. The Tarn, for instance, and even most of the orcs prized honor, but for Jaina, it was far too late for that. There is no hope for peace. There's no time for strategy. She has the ruination in her grasp, and they're a fool for not seizing the chance. She turned her back on them both as they tried to calm her down, tried to make her listen, but she would not. Her next stop, that led her to Dalaran, where she asked the aid of the Kid and Tor. Varisa Windrunner had also returned to Dalaran after Battle of Feramor, and she was as wounded as Jaina was, even more perhaps, with now being a widow and having to raise her twins by herself. Jaina told her about the final moments with Ronin, that all he cared about were two things when he died. He wanted to make sure that his beloved would survive, and that Jaina would survive. He bought their lives with his own, and Jaina doesn't understand why he saved her. Feramor was her city. She should have died for it, but he was the one who died, and she will not forget that, not as long as she draws breath. She will urge the council to make sure that the Horde is never, ever in so powerful position again, that no one else has to suffer as they have. Varisa's lips curved into a trembling smile, and the next thing the mage knew, the two women were hugging each other tightly, and Jaina felt warm tears against her neck. While she waited on the council to make the decision, she also visited the Sparkshine family. She had planned to be eloquent, to praise Kindy as the girl deserved, to give her bereaved family comfort, to let them know that Kindy had fought well and bravely, that she had been a light to everyone who knew her, that she had died defending others. But what burst from Jaina's lips was, I'm sorry. I'm so, so sorry. And for several long moments, it was the Sparkshines who gave Jaina proud more comfort. 
window, he lights the street lights in the city, and with special permission, he lights them in honor of his daughter. The golden light was traced in the shape of a laughing gnome girl with pigtails. When the sketch was done, it came to life for a moment, small hands covering a giggling mouth, and Jaina could have sworn that she heard Kindy's voice. She glanced down with blurred vision at window and saw that the gnome also wept, though his eyes crinkled a loving smile. Now the spider wishes, Katgar lets her know that the kid and Tor will not join her in this slaughter. There are innocents in Orgrimmar, people who never marched on Fethermoor, an orphanage even. But Jaina sees no innocents, only those that are being taught to hate them and will one day march in the name of the Horde. Before Katgar could speak, she'd already conjured a portal to the library of Daladan, stealing a book with information on the focusing iris. If nobody was going to help her, then she was going to do it herself. Before finally leaving the city, she made a quick trip to the statue of her mentor, of Archmage Antonidas. And there it was, where she ran into Caligos again, who was still busy looking for the Idas. He too was asked to join her, to help her destroy the Horde. But he can't. This hatred, it wasn't her. The Jaina he knew still saw peace, still tried to understand, even as she prepared to defend her people. He can't believe that this is what she truly wants, to perpetrate the same horror on them as they had done to Fethermore. This, this is me. This is who the Horde made me when they dropped that cursed bomb on my city. You don't want to help me? You don't hear the voices that cry out for justice? Fine, don't help me then, but whatever you do, do not get in my way. There were voices from all sides that told her to stop and think, to not go through with this. But Jaina, she refused to listen. She spent days working her magic, gathering elemental force of water to create a massive tidal wave and flood all of Orgrimmar. The men, women and children all would feel the pain that she felt. But the elements, they did not want to do this. They screamed out in protest. Their cries of anguish were heard by Goel, and he found his old friend about to make a huge mistake. But it took everything that the world shaman had just to hold the tidal wave in place. Jaina was wounded, anguished, placed the blame of Fethermoor squarely at Thrall's feet. He was the one who had left Garrosh in charge of the Horde. She had begged him to come back, to remove him from power. She had known that he was going to do something terrible one day, and now he had. Garrosh may have done this, but she blames Thrall for giving him the power to do so. The words shocked the shaman, and their battle was intense. Nothing that he said could reach her. All he could do was focus on the tidal wave, and while he was not ready to take Jaina's life, she felt no such reservations. Thankfully, Caligo showed up in search of the focusing Iris, and he found it together with his dark mistress. He understood her loss, and he knew what she felt. But regardless, if she claimed her vengeance or not, the people that she had lost, they would not come back. Jaina's hurting. The pain and grief is overwhelming, and the Horde must pay. Frau agreed. The Horde had to pay, but not by her hand, and not in this way. There is justice, and then there is vengeance. She must see the difference between the two, or else she is going to betray those who loved her. Garrosh is indeed a thief, and a coward, and a butcher, but she was doing precisely what he had, right down to using the same artifact that had obliterated Fethermore. Is this what she wanted? To be remembered as a garage by her own people. I am doing what I know to be right, she shouted. As did Arthas, Caelic responded, when he slaughtered everyone in Strathholm. And he at least didn't act with hate in his heart towards those he killed. Is this what your legacy is going to be? To be another garage, another Arthas? Jaina? I'm sorry, Arthas. I can't watch you do this. No. She decided, no she would not, but for what he has done, Garrosh can be nothing but her enemy, and the Horde as well, as long as he is their war chief. She would not use the elementals gathered to flood all of Orgrimmar. Instead, she was going to use them to defend her people. Go well, then went back to the Urban Ring, the former friends knowing that this goodbye meant the end of their friendship for so many years, so cherished and championed by both. It would be a long, long time, if ever, before Jaina could call for her friend again, and she knew that he knew. Gaelic did stay at Jaina's side, and he offered to carry her wherever she wished. She wanted to see Orgrimmar with her own eyes, and en route, they discovered that Varian and the Alliance fleet, they'd also made the way here. Despite all their clever planning, Garrosh had his own tricks to use against them. He had a shaman raise Kraken from the deep. Kraken with huge tentacles that whipped about the vessels, closing in around it in a parody of a loving embrace. The war chief did not just send the creatures of the deep to do his fighting. He too, with Gorhal in hand, he jumped into the fight. 
Varian saw that despite the Horde fleet being vastly outnumbered, Garrus' tactics of using the Kraken, it was doing a whole lot of damage. They would have probably lost the whole fleet in that battle, was it not for Jaina and Caligos, who sent her water elementals to save the fleet. She had not expected them to be there. She thought that they would focus on breaking the blockade at Darkshore or at Fatimu Stronghold. If she had truly sent out this tidal wave, she would not only destroy Orgrimmar, she would have taken out the whole Alliance fleet. Luckily, that didn't happen, and Jaina was able to turn the tide of battle. She and the Alliance were able to defeat the Horde and reclaim Northwatch Hold. This time, together with Kaelic, she visited Fatimore once more, not to rage and hate, but to observe and mourn. The love between the Blue and the Mage, it was still growing, and she wondered where to go next, what she wanted in this world. She still cared for peace, but she's no longer who she was. She doesn't burn for vengeance, but neither is she the woman who longs so much for harmony between the Horde and the Alliance. There can't be harmony. Not while Garrosh leads the Horde, not after what he has done. She doesn't believe peace is the answer anymore, which means that she doesn't know where she belongs. But Kaelic thinks she does, and he was right. She wanted to go home, she wanted to go back to Dalaran and the Kirin Tor. There, she offered her services to them, but they didn't want her just as a member, they actually wanted her to become their leader. You see, the whole reason why Ronin had saved her instead of himself, that was because of a prophecy made by the red dragon Coriastras. After the red comes the silvers, she who was golden and bright, the proud lady, humbled and bitter, shall now turn her thoughts to the fight. Sapphire to diamond, she gleams now, the Kirintor leader who comes, queen of a kingdom now fallen, Marching to war's martial drums. Be ye warned, the tides of war at last shall break upon the shore. But the chooser, just based on this, she couldn't imagine. Yet Aphis explained that it wasn't just because of the prophecy. She'd always been strong in power and character, even when tested and tried. And when she faced both an unimaginable horror and an inconceivable temptation, and were perhaps even tainted by the effects of the mana bomb, she still chose a path that was fair and just, rather than vengeful and dark. Yet, she did not do this alone. She had help from Kaelic to show her the right path. So the blue, he decided to stick around and also join the Kirin Tor. And so it was that Lady Jaina Proudmoore became the leader of the Kirin Tor, knowing full well that the world could not be safe with Garrosh Hellscream as leader of the Horde. The Warchief may have lost the battle, but he was far from defeated. Garrosh believed that they were simply thinking too small. Next time, they would have to go bigger. More elements, more Kraken, more of everything. Yet there were voices amongst the Horde that did not believe his actions, his way of warfare were the way to go. Bane wondered if Garrosh was mad with power or simply mad. In the meantime, the Alliance and Horde found a way to the mysterious land, previously hidden by mists. The faction war, it moved to Pandaria. A land full of resources, people, the perfect spot to fight one another, was it not for the Shah that feeds on negative emotions. Our arrival, it caused a whole bunch of problems for the Pandaren. Problems that we tried to clean up. But two months later, the rest of our forces make landfall and the war can escalate. Garrosh has no intention of giving up his dreams for conquest and will do anything to make it so, including the use of an ancient artifact called the Divine Bell, which allows you to harness the power of the Shah. Meanwhile, Varian asks the Alliance to check in with his son Enduin Dalaran, who's trying to convince Jaina to kick the Sun Reavers out of the city. They claim fealty to the Horde and represent a major threat to the war efforts, but despite Jaina claiming that she could never be neutral while Garrosh leads the Horde, she's not on board with the plan. My father isn't asking you to pledge the Kirin Tor to the Alliance. Anduin, I know exactly what he's asking. Oh, look who's arrived. May Nobody Ma dislikes Garrosh more than me. I wrestle with my anger every day. Come with me. Look around you a moment. In the aftermath of Theramore, my first instinct was to decimate Orgrimmar. To kill every man, woman, and child in the city. Jaina. I'm not proud. Since then, Kalatgos and I have talked at length about power and how it should be used. The Kirin Tor has a legacy of abuse. Kel'Thuzad turned his knowledge of the arcane arts toward necromancy. Kael'thas Sunstrider was also a student here, another of our fold who betrayed us. Every day I ask myself, what's the right thing to do? Anduin, you know more than anyone. It's important to separate the Horde from its people. The Sun Reavers still operate within this city. Alliance and Horde work together. 
As long as we stay above the war, then there's hope for the world as a whole. I see our city as a beacon of light showing the way. If we can trust one another here, then there's hope for the rest of the world. I understand. I'll talk to my father. Thank you, Anduin. She sees working together here in the city as an example to the world and understands that the Horde, it does not mean all of its people. She is right about that, as more and more voices are started to rise up against Garrosh. He won't let his people starve to death in the desert. He will stop at nothing, nothing to ensure a proud and glorious future for the orcs and anyone with the courage to stand with them. Some cheer on their war chief, but others, they believe that this isn't right, that this isn't what it means to be Horde. When Vold in an expedition finds the power to shape flesh and build warriors, he can feel that this is the blackest of magics and he speaks out. This is not what the Horde is about and as a reward, he gets stabbed in the neck. We are able to save his life, and Vol'jin would spend some time recovering, but not everyone agrees with his mindset. When Fral is asked to help out, his own people don't even listen to him anymore, it's Garrosh that is the warchief now, willing to do anything that it takes to claim what he desires. If that means mistreating a couple of blood elves, or using the dark powers of the Shah, something that Varian and the Alliance they actually reject doing, then so be it. Despite people trying to reason with him, he listens to no one but himself, pushing people like Lorfmar to consider old alliances. The war chief's hold over the Horde is definitely weakening, but the time to openly rebel against him is not quite there yet. Speaking out, that could mean the end of them, so they follow his command and search for the Divine Bell. It's the Alliance that tracks it down first though. They can't even imagine the atrocities that Garrosh would commit if the bell were to fall into his hands. So they decide to hide it away within Darnassus, to study it and keep it safe. But the war chief isn't about to let his prize get away. Horde heroes are recruited to infiltrate Darnassus. It's taken them a great deal to get through Jaina's traps and the Sun Reavers, they're risking their neutrality by assisting the Horde. Which means that we have to be on our best. We have to be very careful not to get caught or detected. The bell is located and transported to Silvermoon, while Fanlir Silverforn, he stays behind to clean up our tracks so that Proudmoor doesn't discover our involvement. Seems like he could have done a bit of a better job though, since Jaina, she finds out and isn't exactly happy. Oh no no, the bell! I had Darnassus locked down. Every fumbling rogue that tried to sneak into the city, I caught them. I snatched every two-bit charlatan that attempted to teleport through my traps. I couldn't possibly have gotten through. This was an inside job. Somebody inside the city has the bell, unless... No. These portals connect to Deleron. That means the Kirin Tor. My own Kirin Tor helped the Horde commit this atrocity. I will not be betrayed again. Those responsible for this will be punished. Aethys Sunreaver! You've betrayed the Kirin Tor, Sunreaver. You've allowed Garrosh to move his forces through my city. You have it all wrong, Jaina. I did nothing. You looked the other way. You and your insubordinate kind are no longer welcome here. This is our city too, Proudmoor. <laughs> I see. I will remove the Sun Reavers by force then. You, Aethys, will be coming with me. It's funny that a piece of the story is missing and never made it into the game, which they were actually quite happy about since it caused a whole bunch of discussions and debate. This is a bit of information given about that missing story by Sarah Pine, one of Blizzard writers. When you were stealing the bell from their Nasus, Aphis was supposed to find your portal, follow you in and go, what are you doing? You can't use Kinetor resources for the war effort. And the orc you're with, he gets nose to nose with him and says, you'd better decide where your loyalties lie, elf. And Aphis then slings back through the portal to Dalaran, saying that he saw nothing. For too long, she has toiled to mend fences between the Alliance and the Horde. Time and time again, she has given the Horde the benefit of the doubt. And time and time again, they stab her in the back. She refuses to be betrayed again. 
If the Horde intends to use Kirintor as a weapon against the Alliance, then they have no place in Dalaran. She, together with Verisa Windrunner, leader of the Silver Covenant, who has lost her husband Ronan at Faramor, they strike out at the Sun Reavers. Not all were in on Garrus' plans though. Some didn't even know what was going on, but they no longer cared. Those that did know, those that followed the War Chief orders, they had sealed the fate for the rest of them. The Sun Reavers that comply, they're teleported to the Violet Hold, but those that resist, that put up arms, they are put to the sword. None are allowed to leave the city, so the Dragonhawks are either put to sleep or slain. Even some of the shopkeepers are put down, but the Horde, they work on evacuating the Sun Reaver citizens. They strike back at the Silver Covenant and the Alliance troops stowed away near Antonidas Memorial. They save Aphis and make their escape, but neither side is particularly happy on what went down. Aphis, you're alive. Thanks to this hero, a few of us made it out of there. <laughs> Many more have been sent to the Violet Hold. Denal. Will someone tell me what is going on in Dalaran? Proudmoor. She's gone and expelled the Sun Reavers from the city. She's purging the Horde from the Kirin Tor. She's gone too far. I'm certain the Alliance can move their war mages through the city at will. That human... Witch! When will they learn? When will they see? That the Horde exists because of the Alliance, because of their prejudice and their bigotry. They force us ever closer to Hellscream's Horde. My lord. Alduran, summon the Rangers. Romath, assemble the Blood Magi and add the Sun Reaver's strength to your own. We Sindori will take our future into our own hands. And get this damn thing out of my sight. Hellscream bought his treasure with the blood of my people. I hope it destroys him. Jaina, what's happening in Dalaran? Has there been an attack? The Kirin Tor was betrayed from within. I've handled the situation. How? I've purged the Horde from Dalaran. You have what you wanted, Your Majesty. The Kirin Tor belongs to the Alliance. But you said that- I know what I said. My trust was misplaced. What of the Sindorai? The Sun Reavers. Those that surrendered are being taken to the Violet Hold. I make no guarantees about those who chose to fight. Jaina, you need to talk to me before you act. How I run the Kirin Tor is my business. I was trying to negotiate with the Sindari. I was opening discussions to bring them into the Alliance. By attacking their people, you forced their hand. They chose their own path. You've driven them back to the Horde. You're fooling yourself. Once Horde, always Horde. I see that now. I'm mobilizing the Kirin Tor. Jaina, we've got to work together on this. The Alliance must act as one. Don't get soft on me, Varian. The Kirin Tor has been pledged to the Alliance, but the negotiations between Varian and Lorfmar, trying to get the Blood Elves to rejoin the Alliance, They've come to an end. There's still the threat of the Divine Bell, though. Something that Enduin hasn't forgotten about. While Garrosh displays the powers of the bell, the raw negative emotions too much to handle for most, the prince uses the harmonic mallet to stop him. Your interference has cost me a great warrior, young prince. You'll pay with your life! That is where you are wrong, Garrosh. Mogu made the Divine Bell to create chaos, but the Pandaren created a special mallet to turn the echoes of that chaos into perfect harmony. That mallet was hidden for thousands of years, until now. Die, whelp! There is much I do not know about this artifact. The weak will cannot control this Shah energy, but I will master it. At least the human prince is dead. King Rin now knows the price of his continued defiance. <laughs> Leave me. I have much to think about. I will let you live, so that you can tell your king of the price of his continued defiance. 
Garrosh attacked my son? Where is he? Anduin! Oh, Anduin, what were you thinking? I should have sent you back to Stormwind. He's alive, but his bones are shattered. Send for Velen. Bring him here at once. My king, I promise you, the Karen Tor will come down on Garrosh so hard his ancestors will reel. Blood will pay for blood. Jaina. Endwin will need some time to heal while the war against the Alliance and Horde continued. Their attention was drawn by the resurrection of Le Shendafan, the king, a threat that could not be ignored. On the Isle of Thunder, the Kirantor Offensive, led by Jaina Proudmoore and the Sun Reaver Onslaught, led by Lord Marfaran, they did their best to put a stop to the Thunder King's plans, while also fighting with each other. Step by step, we took more of the island, carved our way to the Throne of Thunder, and after weeks of fighting each other on the island, the final showdown was about to begin. Lord Zhu, the Alliance, the Horde, all chaos is about to erupt out here! Oh, the children! Toshi! Hand me my weapon! My lord, you are gravely wounded! My weapon! Champion, with me! I want you to see this. Hand over the Archmage, and I may yet allow you to walk out of here, Lorthamar! Proudmore! You will release my people from the Violet Hold, or I will cut you down myself! Your people are legitimate prisoners of war! They orchestrated an attack on Darnassus, from my city! The Sun Reavers knew nothing of Garrosh's raid on Darnassus! Enough! There will be no more bloodshed today! I see now why your alliance and your horde cannot stop fighting! Every reprisal is itself an act of aggression! And every act of aggression triggers immediate reprisal. They I have must protect my sovereign every people. attempt at peace. Silence! You must break the cycle. It ends today. Here, the cycle ends when you, Regent Lord, and you, Lady Proudmore, turn from one another and walk away. Rangers, lower your weapons. My lord! Very well. We will stand down. They killed my husband. This won't bring him back. But know this, Blood Elf. There can be no peace while Hellscream is Warchief of the Horde. That is precisely why I wish to conserve our strength today. Lady? Lord. Gather the wounded. Withdraw to the harbor. Everyone, regroup back at the camp. Our work here is done. Aether shifts uncomfortably as Lorfmar assures Jaina that the Sun Reavers knew nothing of Garrus's raid on Darnassus. This is a remnant of the quest that was supposed to make it in. Under the guidance of Taranzu, Jaina and Lorfmar, they decide to step away from each other and focus on the real threat of the Thunder King. Now powerful upgrades were found in the Throne of Thunder for both sides, with Jaina infusing her staff of Antonidas with the power of the Thunder King himself. Sadly, I, I don't think they've actually ever used that for the story, but the power that the Blood Elves obtained and Animus Golem, that has definitely showed up. Either way, with the Thunder King dealt with and Vol'jin finally healed up, the time had come for rebellion. The Horde has had enough of the Warchief, but Garrosh isn't finished quite yet, as he just found some delicious power hidden within the Veil of Eternal Blossoms. The heart of the old god Yasharaj is thirsty. He is dropped in the sacred waters of the Veil, which causes a massive explosion and destruction to the land. The Siege of Orkrimmar had the Allies and Horde face all the troops, all the powers and weapons that Garrus managed to acquire. Even the Warchief himself used the powers of an old god to try and carve out the destiny that he saw. But not even that was enough to stand against the combined might of the Alliance and the Horde. You disappoint me, Garrosh. You are not worthy of your father's legacy. His punishment is not for you alone to decide. I won't let you take him. 
We have all suffered from his atrocities. My people, more than any other. Let him stand trial in Pandaria. There, we will mete out justice for all. Ugh, look at them. Already they plot against us. Seize this moment, Varian. Dismantle the Horde. God's men! Father, what are you doing? What a king must do. I will speak to your war chief. I speak for the Horde. Very well. The Horde has committed heinous crimes, Vol'jin. But some among you fought against Garrosh's tyranny. For that, I am willing to end this bloodshed. But know this. If your Horde fails to uphold honor as Garrosh did, we will end you. Quite a turnaround between Varian and Jaina, as she is now the one who calls for the dismantling of the Hordes. But Varian, he can see that not all were down with Karrosh. As long as they murder the Alliance in an honorful way, it's, it's all good to him. And as Ashran showed, we would start fighting again. We first had the trial of Garrosh to complete though, with Bane and Saranda playing lawyer, while the Bronze Dragons Chromi and Kairos, they used the vision of time to show moments from the past to support each side's case. Witnesses are also called to the stand, and Jaina's financial support for Bane, that revealed. Varian, he didn't know about this, and he isn't exactly happy, not to mention that his son had been part of all of it, but probably the most interesting thing to come out of the trial, that is when Jaina takes the stand. They show the destruction of Fedamor, Jaina returning home and finding Kindy. And when Toronto asks her about the flooding of Orgrimmar, she says that she didn't want to become like Garrosh. Be like Garrosh or be like the Horde, Toronto asked her. To which Jaina, battered, angry, wounded, devastated, honest Jaina, she replied simply, The Horde isn't Garrosh. It seemed like she was actually dealing with her anger, and she made the choice to not let it consume her. This anger put quite a bit of a strain on her relationship with Caligos, a relationship in which she aided the Blue to deal with the aftermath of the Cataclysm. But she decided that Garrosh had already taken enough. She would not let him take the love that she had for the Blue. The tale ends with Kairos breaking Garrosh out of prison, taking him to an alternate reality, which would then kick off the expansion Warlords of Draenor. The attack on the temple where they held the trial, that was not an easy one to repel. Our heroes, they had to deal with their counterparts from alternate realities. Jaina even lost her life, despite those gathered trying to do everything in their power to heal her. All hope seemed lost. Varian told Anduin that there was nothing they could do to save Auntie Jaina, but the prince, he wouldn't give up. That was when the Red Crane knew that his students had not forgotten the lessons of his temple. Hope is what you have when all other things have failed you. Where there is hope, you make room for healing, for all things that are possible and some that are not. His powers made her open her eyes once more. Goel realized that Jaina looked happy. Perhaps she had been healed in more than body, and he wondered how she had been able to accept her raging alternate self. He supposed he would never know. Their eyes met and he smiled at her, and when she stretched out a hand to him, he took it. It almost seemed like Jaina was ready to heal, to get past the hatreds of old, but during the expansion, during Wallace of the Draenor, we saw her once again being unwilling to work together with the Hordes, while Khadgar had no such reservations. Let us pass, Gatekeeper. Lady Proudmoor has expressly forbid Horde from entering Karen Tor grounds. Then let Jaina take it up with me. I am a member of the Council, and you will let me and my friend pass. Very well, Archmage. As you wish. My tower lies just through this pass. While we work on dealing with the threats on Alternate Denor, especially Gul'dan and his Shadow Council, Ketgar is attacked by Alternate Corona Half-Orcan. Now we quickly go after her and recapture her, while Jaina takes care of the Archmage. 
Be still, Khadgar. Garona's dagger was enchanted. <sighs> this wound is grisly. You should see a priest. No. No priest. Cordana, stitch me up. Don't let the Thank Archmage you, down. You're an asset to the Alliance. Uh, I work with the best. I heard you've also been working with the Horde. The rest of the Council of Six wouldn't approve. I don't. <laughs> it's not the first time I've disagreed with the Council, and it won't be the last. <sighs> Keep protecting our Archmage, Commander. We'd be lost without him. The leader of the Kirantor is kind enough to give us a hand with upgrading our legendary ring, and that's pretty much all that she did during the expansion. Our heroes were able to secure victory on Draenor. Alternate Gul'dan is sent over to our Azeroth, and he kicks off another invasion from the Legion. Sylvanas now leads the charge for the Hordes, while Varian commands the Alliance. Both factions, seemingly out of nowhere, were working together again for the good of Azeroth. Now at this point, the roller coaster it, it seems to be over for Jaina, and she seems to have made up her mind. We went from the diplomats working together with Thrall to get some sort of peace going, to the bombing of Fedamor and flooding Orgrimmar. She changed her mind and instead decided to defend, and became the leader of the Kirintor because of the prophecy from Coriastras. She became leader, while knowing full well that she was going to be unable to work together with the Horde as Garrosh as the Warchief. Then we find Anduin talking to her, and they do try to make it work. They try to work together with the Horde in Dalaran, a shiny beacon of hope for the rest of the world. This then leads to the Divine Bell incident, which pissed her off greatly, kicking the Sun Reavers out of Dalaran and championing the dismantling of the Horde. The trial of Garrosh, with deciding to not let hatred consume Sumer Heart, the Draenor with being unwilling to work together again, and then Legion, where she does join the Alliance on the Broken Shore. That's what I meant with the whole roller coaster of emotions. Hating the Horde, not hating the Horde. It was a bit of a mess, but now here on the Broken Shore, it's actually a death trap, and the Horde is unable to hold its ground. They cannot die this day, so Sylvanas is forced to call the retreat, which appears to the Alliance as a betrayal. Varian is forced to sacrifice himself, to give the troops a chance to escape, and with the death of the king, a great burden is now placed upon Anduin's shoulders. His father was a great strategist, yet his armies crumbled at the broken shores. How can he succeed where the wolf had failed? But Velen reassures him that he does not stand alone in this battle, and Tyrande actually compliments him for his wisdom of accepting the Illidari into their ranks. Jane, however, she reminds them all of the Horde's treachery. It's time to bring them to heel like the dogs that they are. Faramor, Dalaran, and now again, they're betrayed by the Horde at the Broker Shore. But the others, they don't see it that way. They can't fight a war at two fronts. They need the Horde's strength in the battle against the Legion. But Jaina disagrees. She believes that the fight alongside the cowards who betrayed his father and left him to die, it would dishonor everything that Varian ever stood for. Dalaran will protect the Eastern Kingdoms, but she will not allow the Horde to set foot within her city. The city is then moved to Deadwind Pass to have a better position while defending the Eastern Kingdoms. The journey, it didn't exactly go without complications, as we see citizens stuck in a wall. While well, the recovery specialists, they're trying to help them out, but that's not what we're here for. We're here to assist Ketgar as he tries to make Jaina see reason. They cannot fight both the Horde and the Legion at the same time. Azeroth will have to be united in the coming war, and for the Kirin's Horde to fight at its full strength, the Horde must be allowed back into their ranks. But Jaina's not having it. The Horde obliterated Fedamor. They left him to die on the broken shore. Again and again, the Horde has proven to be monsters. Cowards, she will never let them back into the city, but Kepgar, he's made his case, and he respectfully asks the council to vote. Jaina warns them that if they let those vermin back into the city, she will not be counted amongst their ranks, and against Jaina's wishes, the council does their votes. They vote to let the whore back in. Only Anson Runeweaver agrees with Jaina's views. And with that, she leaves the Kirintor behind, while Ketgar, he steps up as their leader. We wouldn't see her for the remainder of the expansion, but as it turns out, she's been busy fighting the Legion on her own. She depended on no one, and no one depended on her, while the rest of us, we worked on our order halls and kicked some Legion booty. With battle for Azeroth soon upon us, Jaina will return to the front, as the war between the Alliance and Horde, it flares up again. She's been spending her time searching. She knows how dangerous hate can be, and she doesn't like what it's done to her, but she doesn't know she can still change. She knows what she's against. She knows what angers her, what drives her hate, what she doesn't want. But she doesn't know what calms her, or what she loves, or what she does want. That's going to be part of her journey. We'll also have to deal with the choices of the past, stepping away from her father Dalin, which her people back home at Kal Tiras, they can't really appreciate. Beware, beware, the daughter of the sea. I heard, I heard, across a moonlit sea, 
the old voice warning me beware beware the daughter of the sea beware beware of me the daughter of the sea is returning home but that's a story still waiting to be told for now though i hope i've been able to give you a better understanding of jana's character where she started from and what happened to her that changed her where might the character go in the future well perhaps the answer that they gave a blizzcon it could give us a bit of an insight as to what blizz themselves think of the character jana's complicated uh, just like any <laughs> any other character uh <laughs> she's as evil as i am uh bad example um how evil are you <laughs> That's these guys. Uh, so look, if I'm Jaina, right? As a character, Jaina is racked with regret, right? Looking over her past decisions and the things that she's done, responsible for the death of her father, potentially responsible for what the Horde is today as a result of that. Um, what could she have done differently at Stratholme? Mm -hmm. Could she have saved Arthas? What about the battle for Undercity? So if you kind of unpack all of that and break all of those things apart, it's left a character that has some damage. And, and then not even speaking of Theramore. So one of the things we're going to do is explore that damage, explore those decisions with Jaina and try to understand how she got to be the way she is and hopefully pull her out of it. So no, she's not evil. She's conflicted and it's something we absolutely want to explore. And with that, I think it's about time that we wrap up this video. It's been quite a while since I dove into such a massive character and actually been a lot of fun to try and get as much detail in as I could. Hope you enjoyed it too. And as always, thank you very much for watching everyone. Subscribe if you like my videos. Leave a like if you enjoyed this one. And until next time guys, see ya!